speaker today uh, needs very little introduction uh, among this crowd. Uh, Jerry uh, Michelson is a longtime Cree supporter and, and uh, uh, faculty member. And uh, um, I, I did want to mention, if I can find my sheet, which I just set aside. Uh, just one little honor uh, that uh, um, uh, Jerry's picked up since I think the last time uh, maybe he spoke here. Uh, which it's been a while, but the, the Petropol Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Cultural Life in the City of St. Petersburg uh, in Russia in 2012. There's one of the few instances where that award has been given to uh, somebody outside uh, uh, Russia, as I understand it. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you very much, Lord. All right. Um, actually, delivering a talk in this place and at this time is the end game, the acid test for someone who has had the honor of standing at this podium or rather sitting at this table. The process that leads to this end game is equally interesting and important. Um, I would call it a friendly collegial conversation between the brown bag speaker and Bart Redford. Uh -oh. Because arranging this event is one of the, hun is one of the um, hundreds of, of chores that Bart performs in this center as assistant to the director. In this case, in my case, that dialogue had three crucial moments in the past couple of months. First of all, agreeing on a date. Secondly, clarifying the exact wording in the talk's title, it was changed at least once, and being reminded of the time limit. Now that's the most important. <laughs> uh, for me, because of my idiosyncrasies, this dialogue has pitted me with my friend Bart in his, man in his manifestations, his role as the keeper and as father confessor. For alas, in the punctuality department, I have sinned in the past. <laughs> I admit that swans and swan songs in Russian poetry is a rather esoteric topic compared with other brown bag topics that are either of current topical interest, or at least have some practical consequences. Nevertheless, those of you who have heard the kinds of questions I ask during the Q&A uh, portions of other speaker programs when I'm trying to pretend that I have encyclopedic knowledge of all things Russian, East European, and Eurasian, <coughs> uh, you're about to hear an example of what I have been doing for a living all these years. <laughs> Um, and which is my true passion, I will admit, and that is Russian poetry. Reading it, uh, writing about it, and, and translating it. My long interest in this topic, during which time I have accumulated an enormous amount of data, as I get closer to my retirement one month from now, after 48 years on the faculty, I am using that data, I'm accelerating my, my uh, analysis and making sense of this of this stuff. On one or another of its aspects, I have spoken in the past in Arzamas and Tomsk and Pirm and St. Petersburg in Russia and now here in Lawrence. <clears throat> so far only one five-page segment has been published in a collection of articles on Russian symbolism in the 19th century uh, a few years back following after a uh, Pushkin conference there. A week and a half from today, I will deliver the next installment of this study in Moscow in a conference at IMLI, the Institute of World Literature of the Russian Academy of Sciences. It will be published subsequently. I'm not going to hazard a guess as to when. Those of you who have this kind of experience know that <laughs> Russian publications that are promised for one year may not come out until two or three years after that, but they usually do. I hope it'll be while I'm still alive. I just got a copy of a Pasternak collection that I'm represented in about two months ago, and the, the conference was held um, uh, five years ago. So. <clears throat> now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret here, uh, give you a glimpse, so to speak, into my somewhat messy at times uh, laboratory as a scholar. And uh, these are the stages of development of the study uh, that I've been following. First of all, and 
as important as anything else, if you can believe me, I'm not a scientist, is swans in nature. Swans out there in ponds and lakes and flying and so on. And so I've been doing a lot of reading on that subject. So what the knowledge that I do have so far about swans in nature comes from a lot of book learning, but it also comes from personal observation. Because ever since I started this project, I've been taking advantage of every opportunity to look more closely at swans than one normally does. And a few years back when my PhD student, Tatiana Spector, still taught at Iowa State University, on the way out of there, I spent about an hour and a half sitting at the shore of the lake that is right in front of that university there, where there is a pair of married swans that live. And they came up about this close to me, but they didn't accept the breadcrumbs that I was offering them. Instead, they were pecking away at the shoreline there, getting some bugs. Okay, that's uh, swans in nature. And let's not forget, although this has no direct relevance whatsoever to what I'm talking about today, that up there at night, if the clear sky, you can see what is my personal favorite constellation. It's called Cygnus, the swan. Another name for it is the uh, Northern, Northern Cross. It's a, it's a, it's a spectacular, spectacular um, constellation. So, now, next step in this process, swans in world literature, both folklore, that is oral literature, and learned written works. And as one has to do with a project like this that, has, that concerns the history of anything, you have to go back as far as you can. So first of all, it's the ancients, um, both Asian which I've only dipped my one toe into so far, and um, I'm getting some help from my son-in-law, who is uh, a, a Buddhism scholar, um, but uh, I don't pretend to have gotten very far with that part of it. I'll make a couple of references to it here. So the ancients, I'm referring to primarily the European ancients. <coughs> and then, uh, of course, the next half step here is the modern poets and to a lesser degree, prose writers, because I'm sure if I didn't mention them, I'd give you maybe one or two examples that you would ask me that right off. Uh, are swans as, as numerous in uh, Russian prose literature as they are in poetry? Um, <clears throat> so why concentrate so much on Western European literature, poetry particularly? Well, that's because all of you know that it had a decisive influence on Russian literature ever since the 18th century. In other words, modern Russian literature, especially lyric poetry, is in some sense or another a derivative of uh, the literatures, the poetries of Germany, France, uh, Spain, England, and so on. Now, another still preliminary stage of this, namely swans and even swan songs, in the other arts of Russia. And that's why I brought along these pictures, which I want to send around here. Well, I won't comment on them. You'll be able to see. But uh, I just want to remind you of what should be fairly obvious. I'm not showing you actual swans. I'm showing you images of swans in photography and in um, art, in painting, etc. cetera. Um, and that's an important aspect of this whole thing, sort of, at the periphery at the edges of, of the poetry and literature. Um, I sometimes risk my life when I'm a bunch, among a bunch of musicians and, and visual artists and so on when I refer to poetry as the queen of the arts. I think you guys in the military do this sometimes too. I can't remember whether it's the infantry or the uh, armored. Artillery. <laughs> Artillery. Infantry. That's okay. right. <laughs> um, so, we're still in the preliminary stage here, and that is represented by these artworks uh, that I'm passing around. The most spectacular example in, in uh, the history of painting in Russia is Mikhail Rubil's Swan Princess. That's not a very good uh, Xerox copy that I made there, but it does have the outlines and it gives you an idea of, uh, of what he was doing there. Swan Princess. Then you have, of course, I'm jumping from one art form to another, 
you have Tchaikovsky's ballet Swan Lake, and here you have several art forms represented, all of them depicting in one way or another swans. You have the um, decorations for the, for the opera, because uh, it is, among other things, um, a, a, um, a medium that includes visual arts. Choreography, of course, is the main thing, and music in opera. And I'll be referring just a moment to um, Tchaikovsky's and, uh, and later to uh, Richard Wagner's. So, um, Swan Lake, obviously. And then, from a nearby culture, near to Russia, that is, Jean Sibelius's The Swan of Tuanella, a very beautiful piece of music, is created by the, the swan's flight. Uh, what we're talking about here is the swan's flight, as it were, from one artistic medium to another. In this case, uh, it comes from the ancient Finnish epic to music, Kalevala. Um, <clears throat> and it's happening all the time with anything that you look at that has anything whatsoever to do with swans. Is that uh, it, it exists in a number of different art media, media and it, it involves jumping from one to another or the adaptation by the artist of something in a different art medium into his or hers. Now, still in the realm of music, but a bit farther from Russia, is the French composer Camille Sanson's Carnival of the Animals. And those of you who know this, uh, one segment depicts or metamorphizes the gracefulness of the swan. The gracefulness of the swan. I love also to listen to this piece of, piece of music. Um, the gracefulness of the swan uh, in nature there is transformed into immortal music. Uh, it's that part of it is called the song of the swan or the siege. And finally, this doesn't necessarily mean it's the last of, of all existing, but these are simply the most spectacular and most famous <coughs> examples of what I'm talking about here. Richard Wagner's opera Lohengrin, which is based on the eponymous ancient Germano-Nordic legend of the Swan Knight about which one scholar wrote, and I quote, in a general sense, this legend of uh, Lohengrin, whose father was Parsifal, incidentally, and so it sort of spills over into the opera that's called Parsifal, this, this, um, this legend that uh, Wagner based his opera on may be said to tell of the arrival of a mysterious knight in a boat drawn by a swan at a time when a lady of high degree is in some need of a protector. In other words, she's a damsel in distress, as they used to be called in the 19th century. The closer I, said I could come to illustrating this uh, boat being drawn by a swan is a boat swan. <laughs> it's right next to me on my bed stand. In the, in the bedroom there. I've taken all the stuff out of it that I normally store in there, but you also recognize this an example of Russian uh, enamel painting. Uh, I'm not sure this is a Pollock box, but it's of similar uh, ilk. Okay, the next part of that legend says the, that they marry this prince, marries the damsel in distress. And finally, and this is the tragic part, you have to always expect that with Wagner's operas, as well as for Russian literature, incidentally. The departure of the knight for a foreign country when his wife, the formerly distressed maiden, asks the forbidden questions about his name and origin. Where do you come from and what is your real name? She knew these questions were forbidden, but she asked them anyway, the result of which he left. Now, this author, is the author of that statement that I've just quoted here, goes on to say, and I'm quoting again here now, the swan often appears as a feature in the mythology of the nations of Northern Europe. Even before this legend began to be recorded in manuscripts, it was disseminated widely in the oral recitals of the jongleurs, the Russian, the uh, Russian incarnation of which it could be either the uh, skazitiri, the local tellers of tales, 
or Skamarohi, the wandering minstrel actors, <clears throat> who went about the country rendering the same service as is now done by the printed book. I'm sure that you're familiar with this category of folks from Russian uh, history, which are either Skamarohi, Bill Kalki used to start his courses on Russian theater and drama with a lecture or two about the Skamarohi because they were the antecedents of staged uh, drama in, in Russia. Now, in both Asian and European folklore and literature, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of other versions and modifications of this legend. Too many to talk about even in a few hours. Um, this myth, as it's sometimes called a legend, sometimes a myth, and of a related one, which combines the swan knight, or referred to sometimes as the swan prince, or swan king, merges that with the image of children who change into swans. Now, I've only recently uh, bumped into this one. I know very little about it. But one thing I do know about is that the children who change into swans in this legend, for some reason or another, are not able to change back into children. Once they've changed into swans, they remain swans forever. Now, a South Asian example, this is what I'm starting to learn from my son-in-law, is the collection of stories called the Book of Sindibab. I just want you to remember that name because I haven't even read this work yet. I simply know of its existence. And there is a European offshoot of it that is called the Seven Sages of Rome. You can see how what great distances this legend wanders over from one continent to another even. Now, <clears throat> bringing the wandering image of the swan a bit closer to home, that is, Russia. <laughs> I'm referring to this as my adopted home, <clears throat> uh, or at least bringing it up to the border that separates um, Russia from Siberia, the Ural Mountains. Even the swan legend or myth stressing the swan's magical, mysterious, and even mystical powers Joseph Campbell wrote about. I'm sure you know who Joseph Campbell was. And in this one particular book of his where I found some mention of, of the swan image in uh, primitive folklore, etc., it's called Masks of God, uh, colon, primitive mythology. That's why I'm wearing this, uh, this um, Gizmo here today, which has one part missing that I'm going to try to replace at a place called Michael's later this afternoon. <laughs> this amulet, this amulet or talisman, because it's a, it, it's a mask, okay? And uh, so it has to do with <clears throat> this idea of uh, various identities and so on, various uh, manifestations of one and the same image <clears throat> or legend. <clears throat> now, Bringing the wandering swan image of the swan a bit closer to home, uh, well, I said that already, okay. I, I was deliberately pronouncing the word Russia the way that Siberian somewhat, um, uh, somewhat, um, what's the right word for it here, somewhat mockingly refer to Russia with only one S instead of a long one there, and it's spelled er as s ye uh, yeah, Russia, Russia, because Siberians um, refer, in history did, and a lot of them still do, as Russia is that part of that so-called Russian Federation that is located on the west side of the Urals, and the rest of Russia is on the east side of the Urals, and it's called Siberia and the Russian far north, uh, far east. Okay. So um, I'm going to be quoting at some length here of Joseph um, uh, Campbell because he's been very helpful to me. And, and this quotation will occupy a central place in my uh, talk and article for the uh, Institute in Moscow and for whatever publication comes out of this. 
And it's in that segment of the chapter on shamanism that he called the shamanistic vision, where he writes the following words, and I'm quoting here, and I'll tell you when I'm interrupting the quotation. <clears throat> the shamans of Siberia wear bird costumes to this day, and many are believed to have been conceived by their mothers, that is, the shamans, um, the, the, the birds from the descent of a bird. In other words, the shaman, through his mother's important intervention there, is descended from, from, uh, from the swan, from a bird, not necessarily a swan in this case. Um, incidentally, we find a lot of examples of this also in uh, the folklore and literature of India and, and China. Now, the German legend of Lohengrin, the Swan Knight, and the tales uh, told wherever shamanism has flourished of the Swan Maiden, and that's what Rubel is uh, depicting here, the Swan Maiden, are likewise evidence of the force of the image of the bird as an adequate sign of spiritual power. You'll hear me repeating that phrase in just a moment again, the force of the image. And shall we not think of the dove that descended upon Mary? I'm still quoting Campbell now. The dove that descended upon Mary um, <clears throat> and the swan that beget Helen of Troy. Now, I'm interrupting the quote here uh, because Campbell is referring to the story of Lida and the swan, where, in the, where the chief, pag chief of the pagan gods, Zeus, assumes the form of a swan, uh, descends upon, or we might say, uh, <laughs> attacks Lida, uh, the beautiful Lida, and uh, ravages her. Um, and leaves her with child, and that child is the future Helen of Troy. Because this extended quotation is so important to my study, I'm going to read it to the end, because it has other wording in it that's uh, equally important. And I'm quoting again now. In many lands, the soul has been pictured as a bird. And birds commonly, commonly are spiritual messengers. He goes on to say, angels are but modified birds. But the bird of the shaman is one of, is one of particular character and power. Character and power. Think of the shaman, what you know about him. And uh, you'll see what, what um, he's talking about. Um, particular character and power endowing him with an ability to fly in trance beyond the bounds of life and yet return. Now that's the end of the uh, lengthy quotation from Joseph Campbell, although I'm going to come back now to the key words and phrases in there. Uh, so we're talking about here what our, the main topic of my talk is the role of the swan image in lyric poetry. Um, so now part of this is nature description, but you'll have to agree that nature description as such is not the primary function of lyric poetry. The primary function of uh, lyric poetry um, is to use those kinds of images as metaphor, or possibly spilling over into the category of the symbol. Now I'm going to read the, the key words here again because I'm putting the emphasis on them from Joseph uh, Campbell's. And they are words and phrases. Um, he reminds us, he reminds us in, these, in this quotation that in art, not just in poetry, but in art generally, birds and specifically in this case um, the uh, swans, have a different semiotic, metaphoric, or symbolic function. The key words that I'm referring to here that sort of illustrate what I'm talking about are the first the word costumes, costumes, um, which is another way of saying masks. 
the, the second part of it, da, 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 are believed to have been the force of the image, are, are believed to have been. These swans are believed to have been something. In other words, it takes a leap of faith to get the message in these artworks about the symbolic or metaphoric nature of the swans that are depicted there artistically. The next one, the force of the image of the bird as an adequate sign of spiritual power. Next one, the soul has been pictured as a bird. <coughs> and finally, birds commonly are commonly um, spiritual messengers. Angels are but modified birds, so modified birds here is the key. And finally, the bird of the shaman is one of the is one of particular character and power, endowing him with the ability to fly in trance beyond the bounds of life and yet return. Now, distilling Campbell's paragraph there even further so that we derive the smallest possible residue that can be of assistance here, it boils down to this. Masks, spiritual power, the soul, spiritual messengers, modified birds, particular character and power. <clears throat> Before moving, as I intend to do, and if I don't make it that far, you have copies of this particular poem to take home, and by that time, if you weren't able to do it before, you should be able to analyze it by yourself. I'm going to <clears throat> speed up a little bit so that we can at least get to have a brief look at it. But before doing that, um, before uh, jumping to a, a brief analysis of that poem, and perhaps an incomplete, off the top of my head, translation of it, into English, <clears throat> this is from the Age of Symbolism, part of which, uh, the age of the, which is called the Silver Age, part of which is the Age of Symbolism, roughly 1890 to 1926, those are the boundaries of the Silver Age. Symbolism occupies a much smaller part at the beginning of that period, 1890, let's say, to the early 1900s. <clears throat> I've shown you now, and I won't. I think I'd rather not um, uh, comment on those pictures that you have because they. The reason why I brought those along uh, it should be obvious from just having a glance at them. Um, now, as a brief aside, let me introduce a smidgen of literary theory, so that everyone in this room understands that. At this game of analyzing lyric poetry, I'm not a dilettante or a charlatan. Everything I know about the craft of literary scholarship, what is called in Russian literature, I learned from one person, my mentor, Professor J. Thomas Shaw, who was, while alive and of sound mind, the dean of and the finest Pushkin scholar in the United States the founder and sustainer of this country's best and only Pushkin Studies Center, the J. Thomas Shaw Pushkin School, which we are uh, products of. To paraphrase Pushkin's brilliant bird-related metaphoric characterization of Peter the Great and his followers, we, Tom Shaw's pupils, were and are the fledglings from Shaw's nest. Птенцы из его гнезда. Птенцы из гнезда Петра Великого. For Tom Shaw, there were and are a number of ways to study or approach a poem or any other work of literature. For example, biographical, psychological, historical, formal analytical, or structural. <clears throat> Tom Shaw had nothing but con contempt for such literary theories which often assume agency or even preeminence in the eyes of the beholder. In other words, a lot of people in our time right now believe that theory, literary theory, is more important than literary works themselves. He would have been irate 
<clears throat> if he had sat in my place a few years ago at a triple A panel on women in Pushkin's work, in which I was forced to hear and respond to a statement from the audience, from someone who should have known better, which word for word went like this. In the context of today's discussion, the first premise must be that Pushkin was a male chauvinist pig, unquote. For Tom Shaw, the only proper way, proper approach um, <clears throat> uh, to uh, work of literature and to a valid understanding of uh, a Pushkin text, let's say, was through an application and lens of what used to be called, it's still called that, it's just not used very much anymore, um, <clears throat> initially in reference to scriptural texts, either hermeneutics, hermeneutics, Gerenevtika in, in Russian, or exegesis. Both of these start out in, in schools of spiritual, of, uh, spiritual text analysis. What theory you will find in my talk, in my paper, is not really theory at all. Or if it is, it's been arrived at not deductively, but what's the opposite of that? Inductively. Again? Inductively. And inductively. In other words, not prescriptively, but descriptively, um, based on the evidence, empiric evidence, the text itself. Um, and that thing, which I wouldn't call theory, and certainly not mine originally, I'm just using it, is the concept of metaphor and perhaps symbol, which overlaps with it a bit and one sort of flows into the other at times. Um, and just in case you happen to think, as I did, I guess, up until a week or so ago, that metaphor is just one of those highfalutin fancy tools that literary scholars use in order to impress the socks off of historians and geographers and so on and so on. It's much more than that, and the proof of the pudding is in this book. I just bought the other day a dusty bookshelf. It's called The Power of Metaphor, Examining Its Influence on Social Life. Ask this wrong, please. And it turns out that metaphor is every bit as important, maybe even more important, in all human verbal discourse from the beginning of the time when human beings could talk, as is lying. <laughs> I mean, House used to say, everybody lies, right? I gave my wife a t-shirt that says, House has a picture of House, and it says, everybody lies. Well, you know how important lying is in marriages, in families, in collectives of every sort. But metaphor is even more important. Um, so I'm going to cut way back on this next part because you'll have to take my word for it that the amount of data that I, that I was going to present today is only a fraction of what I have in, in my uh, <coughs> box at home. And what this represents, it's a race against the clock, which I'm watching very attentively, Bart. Um, <laughs> I'm, this is a leaping, leaping, I'm using a metaphor, a leaping from one stepping stone to another across that expanse that covers the history of images of the swan in mostly, because of the inadequacies of my knowledge of Eastern, it covers mostly Western literary history. And I'm not going to uh, give the quotations, I'm just going to give you where they are. Holy Bible. Plato. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to quote this one because this uh, may be where this whole idea of the swan song began, which is an integral part, although not absolutely synonymous with the concept of the image of the swan in poetry. Plato's statement is, the swan sings all his life and even more lustily in death. Cicero, <clears throat> the swan dies with song and rejoicing. Virgil, Chaucer, 
the song, the swan sings its own death. Sir Walter Riley, Edmund Spencer, <clears throat> he's the one who wrote about this uh, legend of Jove or Zeus becoming a swan for the love of Leda. Shakespeare, it's all over the place in Shakespeare. In uh, King John Act 5, um, I am the signet to this pale, faint swan who, ch who chants a doleful hymn to him, to his own death. The Merchant of Venice, Otello. I want to quote this one because it's, it's very poignant. This is right at the end of the tragedy of Otello, <coughs> where Emilia, who was the um, maid for Desdemona, the heroine who is now dead, she's committed suicide because of the misunderstanding and alleged betrayal of Otello and so on. <coughs> Emilia is speaking to, De, to uh, Otello now, and she said, I will play the swan and die in music. <clears throat> That's at the very end of the tragedy. And because I want you to be aware of the fact that you aren't already, and if, if you are, I, pardon, I beg, your, beg your pardon, I want to read a few lines of the Maris Pasternak translation into Russian of that last segment of, of uh, Otello. Uh, because Pasternak was far and away, in my opinion, most people's opinion, the greatest of all the uh, translators of of uh, Shakespeare into Russian. Вот почему ты пела, госпожа. Here she's referring to her dead mistress. Я тоже кончус. I once heard Bill Fletcher, our esteemed former center of director here, and, and he was trying to give a part of a talk in, in, in Russian, and he said, я скоро кончус. <laughs> and what that meant is I'm, still, I'm soon going to explain it. <laughs> so I didn't say anything to him, but, but I should have probably afterward. Well, but when, when uh, Emilia says it, she really means it. Я тоже кончусь с лебединой песни, и тоже иву ивушку спою. Она была чиста, Дестамона. Кровавый мавр, she calls Othello the bloody uh, moor. Она тебя любила, мавр жестокий. Душой клянусь, я правду говорю. И с этим умираю, умираю. And the final stage direction is умираю. <laughs> so we see um, Emilia dying on the stage. Just Quickly, Ben Johnson, he wrote that Shakespeare was a, was a swan. He was the swan of Avon. Samuel Coleridge, Lord Byron, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley in Prometheus Unbound. Um, and then, just very quickly here to, to wind this up, um, in other forms of literature, like folk tales and prose, children's stories, Hans Christian Andersen's Wild Swans, the Russian folktale, Gusi Lebedi, <clears throat> geese and swans, which are often just opposed to one another, either compared with one another or contrasted with each other. And I've seen this with my own eyes, because for me, geese are a repulsive bird. He's, excuse me for the language, but they crapped all over the <laughs> stoop of my house in Wisconsin 20 times one, one did while I was trying to entertain guests on the deck about 10 feet away. That was a goose. <laughs> <clears throat> the swans who I got acquainted with in, in Ames, Iowa, had no such bad manners as far as I could tell. <laughs> Ivan uh, Krilov's fable, now we're getting over into written literature now, Libid. Shuka, Iraq, the swan, the pike, and the crab. Um, and uh, Russian co common saying. There's only one Russian common saying that has the image of the swan in it. And it's one of those that is, exists in all different languages to sing the swan song. Pets, libidinu yapesnu. And last but not least, there is Russian poetry. And just 
goes back to where everything goes back to what Nabokov called in his translation the song of Igor's campaign, Slovo Polku Igorine, and going on with just the greatest Russian poets, Gavriil Dzerzhavin, Pushkin's mentor and predecessor and the greatest Russian poet before Pushkin, Alexander Pushkin, it's all over the place, most spectacularly in Yevgeny Onegin, where he describes the Tsarskoselsky Levity, where he went to school for six years. Those beautiful ponds had swans swimming on them all the time, and they became the source of the metaphoric use of swans of Tsarskoselo, not just in Pushkin, but in everybody else, Gumilov, Akhmatov, Ivanov, Ivanov, that's uh, Vyacheslav Ivanov, uh, Fyodor Tchuchev, um, Afanasi Fiet, um, Vasily Zhukovsky, another one of Pushkin's mentors and older uh, contemporaries, wrote a long poem, which is must reading for someone who's interested in this topic, because it is called Tsarskoselsky Levit. And you have the image of this swan, one of those few uh, species of swan that makes noises with their throat. <clears throat> Flying up high in the air, singing, singing its swan song, and then stopping, not having reached heaven, and plunging to the earth. To its death. Afanasi Fiat, Yakov Polonsky, Vyacheslav Ivanov, Lebedi, Marina Tsvitaeva. Marina Tsvitaeva, who, as you know, was an emigre poet who came back to, the so to Soviet Russia to die in 1941. The poems that she wrote about her <coughs> emigre experience, she wrote these in the 1930s. And the emigre experience of her husband, um, uh, Anatoly Ifros was his last name. He was an officer in the White Guard. She called him that whole cycle of poems Libidin Mistan, the swan's uh, swarm or uh, whatever. And then, of course, I, I study, I look through all the books that I have anthologies of the poems of Russian emigre poets, you can easily imagine why that image would be so popular among them in emigration. I'm talking about the first wave of emigration, where there were many great, great poets. But the one that uh, I've given you, now I'm, that's the end of my talk, um, is she is not the greatest of all Russian poets. Mira Lochvitskaya is her name. Please have a look at this now in front of you. You can read when you go home this brief, briefest of all possible biographical sketches of her. <clears throat> she was uh, a poet of the symbolist school, <clears throat> a predecessor of poets like Alexander Bloch, Valery Bruzov. And even An Akhmatova, who, as you know, was not a symbolist per se, but a so called acmeist, kind of a reaction to symbolism. But this poem is one of the best that I've encountered because it illustrates not all, but a great many of the aspects of the image of the swan that we find in the whole history of the use of this image going all the way back to Plato. Horus is another one that I could have mentioned to do, an early um, user of that myth or legend or image. Um, I looked it through my messy desk for an hour or more and did not find the fairly nice, though rough, draft translation of this into English that I made. And so I'm without that, but so instead of doing that, I'm just going to read this aloud because I think all or most of you know watching well enough. And then I'd like to open it up for the last 
part of the uh, session to, uh, to questions. Spiash chi I want to mention that the word libit is one of those odd ducks, no, odd, <laughs> odd <laughs> swans in the Russian language, because the word libit, spelled exactly the same in both instances, can be a masculine no noun, which is here, spiash or it can be a feminine noun. And if, and if you wanted it to be a feminine swan, you would have to say spiaschilevich. When you learned Russian, all of you, you learned that you can't be sure what gender nouns are when they have the makis knock at the end. That was one of the tough things about learning Russian, wasn't it? <laughs> is it feminine or is it masculine? You have to wait until you see it with an adjective in front of it or until your professor beats you over the head for not having memorized that information. Okay. Spiaschi David. Zimnai Zizn Maya Zvenyashi Nivnatne Shorach Kamusha. Im Ubayukan Levit Spiaschi Maya Trevojnaya Dusha. Vdali Milkayu Tarapliva Visканьих жадных корабли спокойно в заросли залива, где дышит грусть, как гнет земли. Но звук из трепета рожденный скользнет в шуршанный шуршанный кабыша и дрогнет лебедь пробужденный. I'm giving a deliberately old-fashioned um, pronunciation of that last vowel there, stressed vowel. Maya besmertnaya dusha. I panisyotsa v mir svobody, gde vtorit volnam zdohi bur, gde perimenchivaye vody glidica vechnaya lazur. Just one brief comment and I stop. The symbolist period is the period in which, the early symbolist period, poets like Vyacheslav Ivanov, like Vladimir Solovyov, and like Mira Lochvitskaya, used metaphors in such a way that they are or they're spilling over and sometimes becoming, becoming transformed formed into symbols. And the difference, the main difference in a shorthand here between them is the metaphor says that this and that are the same. It can be a, uh, uh, it can be a comparison, uh, a simile, or it can be without that word cock or buta or something. Um, but it refers to a, um, a simil similarity or an equality between two phenomena that are both of this world. Natural world, human world, something of that sort. When they become symbols, then the connection is, be is between one phenomenon, which is of this earth, and another phenomenon which makes the big leap of all we hope we'll make someday, not in the wrong direction, of course, <laughs> into the next world. Okay, and that I think is embedded, it's one of the things that's embedded in this poem. So stop, stop, stop. Questions?